All right, so we uh, talked about uh, the success of open source, about uh, GraphQL and APIs and a faster, better way to manage APIs. We talked about continuous delivery. We wouldn't be complete without artificial intelligence. Uh, so our, our next speaker uh, is a senior research fellow uh, of AI at Uber Labs. Uh, he is also an associate professor of psychology and co um, computer science at Stanford University. Uh, and he has released several open source projects, uh, including Church, WebPPL, uh, and Pyro. Uh, today he's gonna join me to do a QA on uh, open source and AI. So please welcome to the stage, Noah Goodman. Thank you. Fun. All right. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, there's uh, a lot of folks here in the audience who are technologists, but are also making decisions about you know, how to make sense of AI, ML, and what technologies they should or shouldn't adopt. Like, I think the, one of the biggest questions I always get is, A, what is the state of this category of computing, this segment of computing, and open source, and then you know, across all the different technologies. You know, you're working with us uh, on our Deep Learning Foundation. You know, Uber has contributed, uh, Horwald, other projects into that. But people always ask me, like, wh when are we gonna see some standardization around here? What's the state of all this code? Like, help the audience understand, like, where are we at in terms of the technology and, and the use of this, this technology? Yeah, that's a great question. We're definitely at a very early stage. There's a lot of, uh, you know, rich chaos. It's moving fast and it's really exciting. Um, you know, narrowly speaking, I would say there's, there's some amount of convergence that's already happening. Um, it's not in necessarily the, you know, a reduction of the number of different things you can use, but there's much more uh, interface compatibility that's emerging. Mm. You know, the fact that uh, NumPy and PyTorch use very, very, very similar interfaces um, is kind of a, a, an example of that. Um, I will say that I think it's going to take a while for the dust to settle. Um, actually, this morning when I was you know, hearing you talk about the amazing success of Linux, I was remembering myself 20 years ago as a grad student building the Linux kernel from scratch over and over and over. <laughs> and it was awesome, but only if you were extremely technical and had a lot of time on your hands. Right. And I think actually you know, uh, AI is a little bit at that stage where the, the power is there, but it takes a lot of work, a lot of time. Um, and I think over the next five years, what we're going to see, hopefully it'll be less than 20 years, what yeah. we're going to see is that the, the, there's convergence and the tools become much faster to where you can you know, see the same tools across many different applications um, in a much more uh, reliable kind of turnkey way. Yeah, you know, one of the things uh, the, in the Deep Learning Project of the Linux Foundation, you know, there's a variety of different efforts. You know, again, you, you contributed Horvald Pyro. But you know, you look at things like Acumos from which came out of AT and T, but is you know a tool that's uh, I, trying to make the use of data, the packaging of it, and deployment of models and so forth just easier for a general practitioner. And uh, again, early days in, in that project, early days in the projects uh, that you're working on from Uber, but like. Give us a little more detail on how, how f what we need to do to make AI, ML technology easier for, and, and, and uh, being able to be implemented by a broader community. Yeah, there's, there's really two sides of this, um, which is why it's so difficult, because one side is exactly the things we've been hearing a lot about. I mean, I love the continuous integration thing, because I think continuous integration and really solid testing is the, one of the biggest uh, contributions of open source community uh, to AI software. Um, and so I think like, you know, I don't have a lot to say that's really novel beyond do what those guys are doing <laughs> only in AI, right? Uh, but the other side, and I think the thing that complicates it is that AI is still very much uh, open research. Um, and the, the ideas, the kind of very foundational mathematics and ideas are moving really fast. So there are some things that exist and we know they exist and they're appropriate to start making it easier to use. But there's other things that, you know, we just, uh, you know, thought up yesterday 
the, you know, there have been 30 papers on the archive, which is, you know, the main source of all AI knowledge these days, but they were all in the last three seconds, right? right? And so I think uh, it's very hard to know how to make things easier when you're not quite sure what are the things that are really successful and whether they're going to be supplanted by a new unification or new ideas tomorrow. And so it's this kind of uh, bootstrapping process of taking things that seem to be working and building tools to make them successful and hoping that you haven't committed yourself to research uh, ideas that are going to be you know, replaced with something else the next day. Yep. Um, how, did, how did the, the decision around you know, using and leveraging open source at Uber, for example, like what, what from your perspective was the value of saying like we want to put this stuff out there, put it in a neutral home, have a, a solid governance structure behind that. You know, what role does open source play in the AI ML world? So to me, let me take one step back and yeah. describe kind of what, what I'm thinking about the role of open source is. So I've been thinking a lot about um, highways recently. Mm -hmm. Um, not because I work at Uber and there's cars, but because the, the interstate highway system, the Eisenhower highway system, is this amazing example of a common good that could not have been created by any one company or really private organization. It was created collectively, in that case, you know, sponsored by the government, but it radically increased the productivity of the U.S. economy for decades after it was created around in, right after World War II. So that's an example of something that we had to have done collectively, but it provides infrastructure for all of us. Um, so then you might ask, okay, what's the, what's the equivalent of that now? Um, and I actually think these, these projects, these big open source projects are exactly the equivalent of that. There are things that we can't do individually, even in big companies like Google and, and Uber, um, but we can do collectively. And by doing it collectively, um, everybody who is going to adopt it gains a huge productivity boost. Right. And you might wonder, okay, well, you know, Uber is big and energetic. Why couldn't they just do this internally? Um, and I think the answer is that um, in general, but especially in AI, you need multiple, uh, multiple viewpoints and multiple contributors to make sure that the software is exercised and tested. You need people contributing from a lot of different applications so that you don't kind of in machine learning speak, overfit to one thing. Right. Uh, and we've really seen that in you know, the Pyro project that I've been involved with and other open source uh, AI projects. Um, the, the kind of the community input that helps, has helped us make really solid software that we can use and that can be used externally. Um, also the fact that there's a huge synergy. The Pyro project is an example where it's an open source software project that exists only because we get to build on another open source software project, right. PyTorch from right. Facebook, right? Exactly. Um, and so this kind of you know, collective building, I think, is why we just have to be doing it this way. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, one of the things, it, it, as we're seeing uh, a lot of major technologies kind of coming out, 5G, autonomous driving, uh, you know, the kind of edge computing with low latency out there. Like, get, give us a sneak peek of the implications of, of AI technology that is going to be enabled by those adjacent kind of breakthroughs, you know, from both the network connectivity side and then, you know, in the autonomous world. I don't have anything to say about network connectivity, I'm afraid. That's right. Those, that, that, <laughs> that chart I showed this morning. Exactly. Like, it's nobody cool. understands networking. <laughs> like, there's a bunch of people here who do understand it, yeah. but. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll restrict myself to something simple like artificial okay. intelligence. Great. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, predicting the impact of any technology is hard. I think AI is interesting because by its very nature, predicting what it will do is much harder. Right? Artificial intelligence is but, fundamental. Wait, I thought AI was about prediction. Well, yeah, exactly. And so you don't know what your prediction is going to predict until you've done it. Right? Exactly. That's exactly the point. Right? AI is about making, making better decisions, uh, making them from more data, making them more rapidly, making more of them, making them more integrated. Um, you know, as you might imagine, better decision making is potentially a game changer for everything. Yeah. You know, everything that humans do. Um, and so because of that, and because we don't know yet which decisions are going to be made much better and which decisions are going to be made only a little better, um, we don't actually know fully what AI is going to do. Um, I think this is both why everybody's paying attention and there's a lot of hype, and also partly why there's too much hype. 
Yeah. Um, so AI is going to change everything. Um, my own opinion is that it's going to change everything in sort of the way that a power saw changed things. You know, they had hand saws. They could cut things. All of a sudden, when you have a power saw, you can cut a lot more things. Right. Um, and at first, you just cut more things. But pretty soon, you realize you can cut things differently. Um, and AI is going to be like that. Um, it'll first change, uh, you know, kind of change the way we do specific tasks that we already do. It'll then grow out into the rest of our software development uh, process. Uh, some people call it software 2.0, which is catchy, but a little bit over. Um, and pretty soon, we'll, we'll just come up with new things that we can do with it in almost every application. Hmm. Right? So I think what people have to do is keep track of where it's going and not imagine that they can predict right now what it's going to do. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I want to talk about like all the different moving parts, ML, DL, models, data, reinforcement learning, natural language processing, training, et cetera. You know, when you look at all the different components that need to come together, you know, any one of those things is, is complex. You know, there's all this talk of, you know, uh, data is the new oil and, you know, how people will be able to, you know, sort of hoard that aspect. You know, across those different components of AI, you know, what's your thought on, like, where are we doing good? Where can we do better? Like, you know, it's just so many components. I think a lot of people here in the audience are trying to figure out, like, what is my strategy? Where do I invest? Yeah. It's funny. Uh, you say all of those acronyms, and I think, oh, yeah, all the pieces of AI, whereas I heard, you know, all the things about continuous integration, and I thought, wow, look at all those complicated pieces. How can I keep track <laughs> of all of that stuff? So it's in the eye of the beholder. Exactly. Um, but, you know, your, your, your more general question, um, I, I think the answer is maybe the good news is that five years ago it used to be that the different subfields of AI were very different and were powered by very different statistical techniques and technologies. There's been actually a remarkable amount of convergence um, around first, you know, ideas from deep learning, um, but also it turns out, you know, deep learning is not orthogonal to statistical techniques. So, right. you know, the ideas of probability, uh, deep learning, um, those basic tools are behind most of the advances in AI, um, and I think. It's not at all accidental that the, uh, you know, the ar arising of really important open source projects has actually coincided with AI gaining, uh, gaining visibility. Um, and I think the causality is actually, you know, oh, let me say it differently. People talk about why is AI happening now, and they talk about compute and data. Right. Right. Um, and to, ex to a large extent, that's very true. The algorithms have not changed radically. Um, in, in recent years, small advances. Um, but I think they're missing something else, which is software. Um, something that has actually made the, the world of modern AI uh, proceed much, uh, much more rapidly to allow much more substantial uh, software engineering projects is that there are these frameworks um, that build on also kind of old ideas like automatic differentiation, but they're systematic frameworks that allow you to rapidly build much more complicated uh, AI software projects. Right. Um, also, that allow you to deploy to hardware that otherwise is extremely hard to target, right? right. Like GPUs. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think the 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 compute is moving along, doing its own thing. Um, the data is there, and everybody knows that they need to grab their own data and hopefully share it. Um, uh, I think the the point of most leverage for investment is actually the software. Hmm. Um, and it's sort of understanding which software tools are going to allow uh, the most systematic software development that's integrated into the rest of your software, right? the rest of your engineering. Um, and there are some that everybody knows, oh yeah, that's a good thing for AI, right? There's PyTorch, there's TensorFlow. Um, but what's emerging now is a whole bunch of a very large ecosystem of uh, kind of layers that are integrated or on top or useful for deployment and monitoring, right? Just building one, you know, say, deep neural net doesn't actually solve the problems that you have of, uh, you know, deployment, integration, monitoring, testing, evaluation. 
Um, but there's a big ecosystem growing for that now. Right. And I think actually the Deep Learning Foundation is a kind of awesome way to foster that and, and focus the energy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I hear every day people wanting to see more consolidation around these frameworks and, you know, help give guidance. Uh, I want to come back to the, the data question. You know, you said, you know, everyone, you hope everyone shares. Uh, la uh, about a year and a half ago, the Linux Foundation worked with uh, our member companies' attorneys uh, to create an open data license. So this was, the, the concept was, let's kind of similar to how open source licenses have, have allowed for the smooth sharing of code from an IP perspective, let's try and apply those same practices to data where you have sort of a copy left license where you know, there's a, a share and share alike type of uh, function and then more of a permissive license, but two main licenses for, for data sharing. How, how do you see the world of data sharing evolving? Are we gonna see more hoarding? Are we gonna see networks of data sharing? Like the, the Uber urban compute thing I, I, I saw this morning is just very interesting where you hear, here you have this company that's you know, Uber who has really important data that's being anonymized and shared with regulators. I think that's super interesting. Are we gonna see more of that, less of it? What's your thoughts? I hope very much that we see more of it. I'm worried that we'll see less of it. Mm. So I think, you know, there's a, a big pressure right now. People realize that data are fundamental. Um, in some ways, you know, they're more hoardable than software because software now needs to be built collectively for it to function and right. properly. We've got that part right. Yeah. Software is more hoardable, right? It's like, ah, I'm a dragon sitting on my bits, right? Yeah. Um, I think it could go the, the direction, which sadly it has been going, that each company thinks, okay, my gold mine is my data. Mm -hmm. I'm not sharing this. Right. Hopefully we can switch the worldview uh, to start to think of data as something that is, you know, one, a common good, something that belongs to humanity much more than to, you know, individual companies. Um, and two, something that is going to, much like the interstate highway system, allow us to do more if we pool it you know, right. in a kind of vastly super linear way, right? It's not just, okay, we'll share and I'll get the benefit of my data and your data. It's that if we all share, the benefits we get are vastly bigger. Right? Yeah, you're, you're starting to see this in, in some, some of the cybersecurity realm where uh, people are sharing sort of attack vector data, you know, which, you know, if you do share it, then you can do AI and predictive analytics on how to like stop those much quicker than if you were just trying to hoard all that data yourself. I mean probably are gonna be companies that try and, and, and control that network externality and, and profiteer from it. But what we're seeing a lot is, you know, coordination instead of, of hoarding there. Like, it seems like uh, you're seeing some of that, but uh, you'd like to see more. Yeah, and I'd like people to uh, come to believe that if you take two different piles of data that have very different information in it, and you put them together, you get something much better than either one alone would give you. Yeah. Um, and that the only way that that's going to work, uh, that that's actually going to work out is not bilateral agreements, but something more like an open, open data, right? Uh, yeah. Open sharing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'll, gi I'll give you the last word. So that, uh, this is the obligatory question, which is, you know, everyone is also concerned about how AI will affect, you know, how we, live every day and will make us all jobless. I often tell uh, Linus and Greg Crow Hartman and the Kernel folks that as soon as we can get a, a self-creating AI tool for software code that, you know, they're out of a job. But, I mean, it seems like all that stuff's pretty far-fetched. What, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think self-creating AI is pretty far down the road. Um, I think even, you know, general human level AI is quite far down the road, in my opinion. Um, I think what's close is uh, AI as power tools, right? Like mm -hmm. the saw example. So I think, you know, it does matter a lot when a brand new tool comes along and when it's a power tool instead of a hand tool. It changes what you can do and how you do it. Um, and that will result in, you know, dislocation. People who only know how to use hand tools and all of a sudden there are power tools, you know, They've got to do something else. Right. Um, I don't think it's going to, you know, replace all of humanity and all of work, but I think it'll change a lot of things. And we need to think actually carefully as a society about what to do about that, um, hopefully uh, planning ahead instead of simply reacting. 
Yeah. Um, I'm hoping actually that large organizations like the Linux Foundation and uh, human-centered AI initiative that we're starting at Stanford, um, which are not part of companies themselves, can form the kind of the, the, the nexus and the middlemen for thinking about these questions and making choices that are, you know, pro-humanity uh, ahead of the, the impact of, of AI and the, the potential disruptions of these new tools. Yeah, well that's certainly our goal and you know, we really appreciate the work that you've done with us on the LF Deep Learning uh, organization and just the work you're doing in general. So uh, thanks for coming and sharing your thoughts today and uh, let's give a round of applause here for now. Pleasure.